So the study was uh, on warfarin and how you can implement much better accurate dosing of warfarin uh, in uh, the NHS. Uh, warfarin uh, is a very widely used drug, about 1% of the population uh, take warfarin. Unfortunately, warfarin is what we call a narrow therapeutic index drug, which means that the dose required to produce an effect is very close to the dose that causes toxicities, i.e. bleeding in the case of warfarin. It has been shown in many studies that the better the quality of anticoagulation, uh, the less likely you are to get complications from warfarin treatment. So the main aim of the implementation study was to assess how well uh, warfarin could be dosed using genes type guided dosing. This is, would mean that uh, um, the sort of people running the clinic, nurses, pharmacists, etc., would have to do uh, the genetics uh, in the clinic. They would have to interpret the results in the clinic and then decide on the dose to be given to the patient uh, in the clinic. Uh, we wanted to also assess whether uh, the nurses running the clinic found it uh, feasible to be able to do this, and whether there were any challenges in doing this, but also how patients found it to be acceptable or not. Staff at the three implementation sites invited all patients who were starting on warfarin to take part in the implementation. Patients were starting on warfarin for either an indication of atrial fibrillation or venous thromboembolism. Patients had to be of white ancestry and this was for safety reasons as this dosing method had only been tested in this ethnic group. Patients with chronic kidney disease were not allowed to take part. On arrival to the clinic, patients were given a patient information sheet relating to the project. Clinical staff described the testing process to the patient. The testing was performed on a point of care machine called ParaDNA. Clinical staff then input the results into a dose calculator and patients were dosed accordingly to their genotype for days one to three. An additional appointment was required at day four for the patients. An INR test was taken and the result of which was put into the dose calculator program. This would then decide the doses for the patients for days four and five. And this was a change to the clinical pathway for patients routinely with atrial fibrillation, who would normally return after a seven day period. This slide demonstrates the processes taken to achieve the genetic result. Firstly, the clinical staff would take a buccal swab from the patient. DNA from the buccal swab was then transferred onto the sample collector, which in turn was loaded into the reaction plate. The reaction plate was loaded into the ParaDNA machine and the sample ran for 45 minutes in order to complete the analysis process. Four samples could be run at any one time. Users were initiated and trained in all aspects of genotype guided dosing. After receiving patient swab samples from the nurses, DNA was extracted from each swab in the lab. Each extracted DNA was subsequently quantified and assessed for quality. Normalised DNA were then genotyped via the technical chemistry to check for genotype concordance with the results from the power DNA point of care device. We were very interested in the project that the Clark were doing. It linked very nicely with one of our themes around um, stroke prevention and atrial fibrillation. And we worked with, uh, with, the, with the Veneers team at the University of Liverpool to establish the project. Um, our contribution to the project uh, was project management and also the management of comparator sites. So one of the things we produced as part of our stroke, atrial fibrillation and stroke prevention work was a dashboard um, that just showed how everybody was doing um, across the northwest coast and commissioners um, and also hospital teams uh, found that quite useful. So um, the data that we collected was all anonymous, um, so there was no patient identifiers on it at all. So, and it was suitable for analysis, so the statistical team could use that, that data um, in, the, in their um, evaluation of how well this worked. So um, we, we were very pleased to have the partnership on this because it wasn't a project that we could have done on our own. 
um, we hadn't got the expertise that the research nursing team had in actually being able to implement this, uh, this, this activity. Um, the, the nursing teams had taken part in the original research trial uh, which was using a technology uh, from a company called LGC um, and were very well acquainted with how that technology worked and also very well acquainted with um, being able to work with nursing teams in clinics to help implement the technology. Setting up the implementation sites also had its own challenges. A logistics meeting was held with each of the three implementation sites. Discussions were held with all clinical teams at each implementation site prior to going live and this enabled the project team to identify the clinic's current routine processes, patient pathway and the changes that would be required to accommodate the genotype guided dosing which were different in each site. It was important to establish if the clinics could accommodate the new technology and the additional patient appointment that was needed for dosing on day four. There were differences in the operational processes of the individual clinic teams which had to be accommodated for the project. There were also training issues that needed to be addressed. The reality of organising and coordinating sessions for each of the sites and the pressures of organising this for a busy anticoagulation clinics who had their own individual staffing issues and workload issues that would need to be addressed. These training issues were resolved through collaborative working between the project team, industry partner LGC and the clinical teams. Training was tailored to fit each trust needs but standardised as much as possible for consistency across the trust. Importantly, the clinical teams needed education not only about pharmacogenetics and the benefits of pharmacogenetic testing but also on how to introduce and discuss genetic tests with patients and families. So the data we collected for the study um, was over the first 12 weeks of warfarin treatment and we collected for all patients in both groups INR measurements, dose changes, details of hospital admissions and um, details of treatment withdrawals. And for the statistical analysis, uh, the outcomes assessed were a primary outcome of percentage, time and therapeutic INR range during the first 12 weeks of treatment. And we also measured secondary outcomes, which were occurrences of INR greater or equal than four in the first week of treatment, occurrences of INR less than two in the first week of treatment, and also total number of clinic visits during the first 12 weeks of treatment and patient adverse events, including bleeds, mortality and other morbidity. And so in our analysis, um, we did a primary comparison of the implementation group versus the data collected in the control group. And we included in that analysis all patients that were followed up for at least two weeks. And if their baseline INR was missing, we assumed that to be one. We also undertook a secondary comparison, which compared the data from the implementation group versus the control group data plus the dashboard data combined together to boost the numbers. And here is a summary of our results. So for the primary outcome of percentage time in therapeutic INR range, we found that the mean percentage time and range in the implementation group was 62.74% whilst in the control group it was lower at 54.86% and in the combined group that includes the control group data and the dashboard data it was 55.25%. So that gave a difference of almost 7.5% between the implementation versus the combined control group and at almost 7.9% difference in the implementation versus the control group only. And the p-values here are less than 0.05 and therefore we conclude there is a statistically significant difference in terms of uh, percentage time spent in therapeutic range between the two um, groups. We also find, uh, found a significant difference in the occurrences of INR greater or equal than 4 during the first week. And similarly, we have differences in occurrences of INR greater, uh, sorry, less than 2 during the first week. Um, where we compare the implementation versus the combined control group. Um, the median number of clinical visits, clinic visits um, were the same across um, both the implementation group, the control group and the combined control group and so we didn't find a significant difference in this outcome between the groups. In addition to these outcomes, we also sought patient feedback by administering questionnaires um, at the end of the 12-week follow-up in the implementation group only. And we had 114 patients um, completing those questionnaires. 
and the uh, genotype guided dosing approach was viewed favourably by the majority of patients, although a small number did comment that the time spent at clinic was a little bit too long. We also sought anticoagulation staff feedback at the end of the 12 week follow up in the implementation group also. Um, and this was completed by 12 anticoagulation nurses and one healthcare assistant. And overall, they were very positive about um, their understanding of the sample collection process, dose calculation process, and the genotype guided dosing initiation procedures. They were also positive about their experience of giving out information on the process and also on collecting additional information required. However, they just showed some concerns about the timing of the genotype guided dosing process and how it fitted in with the running of the clinic. The health economics evaluation conducted used the UPAC model, uh, but only for the UK setting. It's a Markov model analysing the cost effectiveness of pharmacogenetic guided dosing versus standard dosing. And as in the UPAC trial, the model we used here compares direct medical costs for the two treatment options over a lifetime horizon and also presents information on the comparison of the incidence of adverse events and quality adjusted life years. So as we can see from the results, the UPAC model could be used with real world evidence. It was shown to be cost effective to implement genotype guided dosing of warfarin with point of care genetic testing into the three clinics. The discounted ICER, the economic value of the intervention compared with standard practice, was just over £7,500 per quality. And from the project, it was concluded that the genotype guided dosing approach could be included in routine clinical practice. And what this basically means is that using genetic testing helps you to be able to dose warfarin at the beginning, but it is, it is important to state uh, in terms of future practice that genetics helps at the initial phase of warfarin initiation. It doesn't help for the later phases. Uh, you still need to continue to do some INR testing, but by undertaking genetics at the beginning, you get patients into the therapeutic range much more quickly, and therefore hopefully they are more likely to stay stable uh, throughout, the, uh, throughout the time.